So let's go through those first five teams. I know you have your mock draft on dailyfaceoff.com right now. And let's just let's discuss what the fantasy implications are going to be. So we're going to start, of course, with the Chicago Blackhawks landing Connor Bedard. What do you think is the ripple effect from a fantasy perspective for the Blackhawks now? Well, it can't be worse than it was this season. Uh, obviously, this team was not very good this year, and you know they 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 look like they could have got that number one pick up until the final few days of the regular season. I think you know you can only go up from here at this point. Uh, it should be very easy to attract some quality um, quality players. I think this summer uh, they'll have the cap space to do it. They were they were planning for a big prospect like this when they started to really sell off a year ago. Um, one guy I'd keep an eye on is, is Seth Jones. As you know, he lost the two guys he was passing to and in Tays and then Kane, mostly Kane, obviously. But now he's got a guy where he'll be setting up a dart in all situations. I think that would be one where that would be kind of interesting. But, you know, looking at the roster right now, there's obviously not a lot great going for it. But I do think, you know, they got a really good prospect pool. A lot of that won't be ready right away. But I do think that in time, they're going to get the pieces they need. And, you know, from a long-term perspective, this could be a group that becomes a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, that's a good point. It's funny. I was going through who I thought would benefit, and I, I overlooked Seth Jones. It shows how forgotten he's become in those first couple of years of the Blackhawks. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. Totally. Seth Jones gains a lot. I think the name that I'm watching the closest absolutely is Lucas Reichel. Uh, obviously, they slow played him a little bit in the AHL. He had nothing left to prove, and he had his moments late the season, I think. And I definitely expect him to be a full-time NHLer next year. So to me, there's just on paper right now, not a ton of competition for him to end up high in the lineup. And I know he's been known to play more than one forward position, but I, I think it's a situation where the, the Blackhawks, they could shoehorn him into a line and make it work with him and Connor Bedard if need be. And I think you're right about the free agency situation. The Blackhawks have, I think, more than $40 million in cap space. So who knows who they might be adding to the fray. And obviously having Bedard is a massive sell selling point, especially not just if you want to go to a winner, but if you're looking for a one-year deal and the chance to play with Bedard, puff up your stats. That's another way to lure a free agent. And of course, I'm wondering if Patrick Kane might be going back to Chicago now to sort of be the former first overall pick mentor, sort of the insulation for Bedard, even from a media standpoint. So we'll see about that. I'm wondering if he could sort of revive his career from a fantasy perspective as well. Uh, and also from a prospect perspective, a guy I'm really looking at closely uh, is Kevin Korczynski. So we don't know if he's going to be an NHL or this year, but his potential, as Ryan Kennedy said on our previous episode, very high. And if you just look at the possible power play scenarios down the road, Krochinski is going to be the guy quarterbacking it. And I think he could have some monster fantasy numbers in a few years. So, Stephen, let's talk now about the Anaheim Ducks. So they're the quote unquote loser. They had the best odds in the draft lottery, 25.5%, but they're still getting a really good player. It's likely going to be Adam Fantilli. What are the fantasy implications there? Well, first off, this is very fitting because this is exactly what happened in the Sidney Crosby draft. Um, but, you know, I was, I really had some like, great thoughts about like how fun it would be to see a power play with McTavish and Bedard and Zegris and Zellweger. And you could even throw Drysdale. You could put literally two defensemen on there, but because Zellweger acts as a four forward, that would have been great. Um, but you know, it won't be, they'll be getting likely Adam Fantilli, a guy who was asleep during the draft lottery. Um, haven't talked to him yesterday and you know, he was excited no matter where he was going to go, but you know, I think the big question of whether at this point is whether or not he'll go to the NHL next year or not. I talked to him. He said he hasn't decided. I kind of got the sense, though, it's kind of like, we'll wait till the NHL team tells me what's going to happen. And I think in this case of Anaheim, he could step in immediately. Um, and they got a really good young core. And I've written about them before for Daily Faceoff. I think that they, they got a, a good group going on. Um, and a couple guys that I'm looking at potentially benefiting from, let's say he does play next year, Frank Fertrano, a guy who had 41 points this past year, you know, I think very underrated. Um, but now, you know, he played well with Strom. But if you have a chance to play with Fantilli, I think, you know, that t unlocks a few extra steps there. There's a lot more excitement and a lot less to lose. You know, uh, I think that's a pretty exciting position to be in. Um, and then also another guy's um, one of the guys that got in the um, 
the John Klingberg trade, which was Nikita Nestorenko, who I think is actually a guy that's going to be very underrated. Maybe, you know, could hit 35 points this this coming season as a rookie, which wouldn't be bad for a guy who was kind of underrated. Uh, and you give him someone to play with because, you know, at the end of that season, he was playing with Isaac Lundstrom on the third line. But if your third liner becomes Ryan Strom or if it is, and Tilly, you know, I think that definitely gives them a bit more um, push there. Uh, and I do think it will also help a guy like Jimmy Drysdale having another guy to pass to. You know, I do expect Fantilli to play power play, whether that's first or second. I'm not totally sure, but he can kind of do a lot. He played a lot of different roles this year with Michigan. We saw that with the Chicago Steel. We've just kind of seen it throughout that he's so versatile. And that's what makes him such a good prospect, a guy who would be number one in most other drafts. So I think, you know, there's a lot of guys in that situation that will really thrive. But those are the ones I'm kind of keying in there. Yeah, I think those names are definitely ones to watch. The guy that I'm most curious about in terms of the ripple effect is actually Trevor Zegras, which might sound strange because we think, well, Trevor Zegras is the center, Adam Fantilli is the center, Mason McTavish is the center. But to me, that might be a good problem to have because I wonder if Trevor Zegras' skill set long term might be better served on the left wing. He's not really a powerful guy. He's not really known for his defensive acumen. And I could see a future where Trevor Zegers plays more of a Johnny Gaudreau type of left wing. Where you can, We've proven in the modern version of the NHL, the way the game goes east-west, Mitch Marner as well, you can be the primary puck carrier and make things happen on the wing. And I wonder if there's a way to create a loaded line down the road where you have Trevor Zegers playing with Adam Fantilli. Just because of the fact that, you know, so far we know Zegers has tremendous offensive skill, but he hasn't really rounded out the defensive side of his game yet. So... I don't know. I think that could be an interesting scenario. I'm not saying I've heard anything that that's a plan, but it's just something I envision that could make sense down the road. And obviously that would be a boon to Trevor Zegers' value if he can be out there at the same time as Adam Fantilli. So next up, Stephen, we'll talk about the team that I guess we have to call the biggest loser of draft lottery night, the Columbus Blue Jackets, because they had, I believe it was the second best odds and they miss on both lottery spots. They fall down to the number three spot, which of course, it's still going to get them a great player in this draft class, but maybe not necessarily a player going right to the NHL. So what do you think about the implications for Columbus? This one's interesting because when I was looking at what to place um, uh, Matthew Mitchkoff in mind. I was like, could Columbus do it? But, you know, they made it clear they're looking for a centerman and they got a really good opportunity here to get a guy like Leo Carlson or Will Smith. I'm leaning towards Leo Carlson. I think, you know, he's more you don't pick a guy who's more NHL ready at this point because that could be, uh, you know, you're you thinking short term there more than long term. But with Leo Carlson, I just think that he's going to be a number one center and he'll be the number one center that Johnny Goudreau really needs. Now, you know, Again, I'm now almost more kind of thinking like Will Smith's kind of got that skill to really play with a guy like Goudreau. But I think, you know, with with Carlson, he could be that net front presence. He's got the two way game. He's he could be physical. He could do all that. And that's a nice little addition for a guy like Goudreau, who in his first season in Columbus, you know, we, we expect big things from Goudreau. I thought he had a, still a good season all things considered. But, you know, when he's playing with guys like Boone Jenner and, and Sean Corrali as your number one centerman, it's, you know, it's not exactly, you know, Leo Carlson is not exactly a number one guy that you really believe in. So I think that should really help. And and that would also be good for a guy like uh, Kirill Marchenko, who's all a really good goal scorer. And you, you're we're expecting to see him continue to rise up the ranks the next couple of years, but might not be the most defensively sound player. You know, Leo Carlson can handle that a bit better. And I think that takes a bit of responsibility away from Marchenko and just says, just go score. Just go do what you do best. And that's really good there, too. Uh, so, you know, I think those are the ones that could really benefit from playing with a guy like him. But, you know, I, I think Carlson's ready. I don't know if he's going to be playing a full-time role in the NHL, and it might be something where they ease him in. I think the Blue Jackets can be very patient there, but if they end up picking him, you know, I think he should be at training camp. He should be contending to make the top line right out of the, the bat there. So uh, I do like Columbus's future. They got some good young guys coming up. I think this is going to be a good future. It's just, you know, it, it, there's still some work to be done. They did come second last in the NHL this year. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's interesting because I, I do envision them taking Leo Carlson as well. And from a real life standpoint, I think it's a great, great fit. And I know there's been Andre Kopitar comparisons for Leo Carlson. And if you think about the idea of the perfect line archetype, it goes right back to like playing NHL 2003 and you're putting grinder score playmaker. It's like you need every great line has the passer, the digger and the shooter. So if you have the passer and Johnny Gaudreau, you have the shooter and Patrick Laine. Theoretically, a digger, Leo Carlson, can make the perfect line. Like That could be an absolutely dominant line in the NHL. The only thing I wonder for fantasy purposes, 
as you implied as well, we don't know 100% that Leo Carlson is playing 82 games in the NHL next season. So there may be a learning curve. There may be a wait because, of course, he's coming from Europe. He could play in the AHL for a little bit too. So it's just a matter of wait and see. But if it seems like he's going to make the team out of training camp, then giddy up. It actually could be a very fantasy-friendly situation right off the bat for Leo Carlson and the Blue Jackets. So next up, we have the San Jose Sharks, a team that's just in flux because they still have some of their veterans like Eric Carlson, Logan Couture hanging around. They have Thomas Hurdle signed long-term, but the team is sort of in transition. So it's more of an awkward situation to figure out for fantasy. What do you envision right now for the Sharks? This one's tough because I do kind of think that you know, if they're going to pick the best player available, and let's say that is Will Smith at that point, you know, you're going to, you're going to be waiting at least one year there for him. Um, and, you know, he's going to be going to college. He'll be playing with the entire uh, same line he had this year at the U.S. National Development Team. So that's going to be a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, this is not going to be a, a super quick transition. So when you're looking at it, the Black, uh, the Sharks are still trying to build towards the future. They got one of them the worst prospect pools in the league. So they really need to hit on this one, um, which is also part of the reason why I don't think they would go for a guy like Michikov, which, you know, he's a top four quality prospect, but San Jose needs to start building towards something. And uh, that's uh, picking a guy who can't come over till 2026. I just, I don't see it happening. Um, but a guy that I think would really benefit there is William Eklund. You know, he's a, a if he becomes a full-time NHLer this year, he probably won't have a lot of great quality players to play with, but, That'll change in a year or two if they pick a guy like Smith who could be that creative high IQ play driver that Eklund needs to play alongside. And um, so I, I am thinking a little more long term here um, because, you know, they we, we still got to see where they take this thing through. They, I, I think if I, I give them the lowest rating, I believe, of all the teams in my pre-draft lottery um, prospect pool ratings, just because I just don't love what they got there. I don't think they got a lot of guys that are going to be a huge difference maker, but I think that he could really start to push things forward there. Um, Will Smith and, and a guy like William Eklund could really benefit from that as having someone to play with essentially. Yeah. And I, I had Will Smith earmarked for San Jose as well, of course. And, but I agree with you. It seems like more of a long-term situation and the Sharks might not even be a team that wants to start improving immediately this year. Maybe they could use one more year where they're bad and they could add another big piece to the pool. And plus, they have to figure out just, are they trading Eric Carlson? Are they bringing in more futures? So it also means there might be less pressure on whoever they pick it for to come right in. But I also agree at the same time, it's not like you necessarily want to wait several years. But I could see, let's say, Will Smith, maybe one more year of seasoning. We'll see what happens. And last, Stephen, uh, I want to talk about the Montreal Canadiens, who are now looking like they will be picking, I, I think, still a very good player at number five. But there's a little bit of a drop off, it seems. It depends on how you look at it. Like I picked Ryan Leonard to go there and, you know, talking to a lot of scouts, I, I pulled a, which I can't fully agree with, but I pulled about 10 scouts. Like, would you rather have Leonard long-term or Smith? And it was actually six to, to four in terms of people picking Leonard. Uh, they just think, you know, the way that he can really take over a play, you know, he's very smart as is Will Smith. Uh, he's got that, that, that frame that allows him to throw some hits. He's willing to do that. Um, but they just say he looks more like a pro ready player. You know, he's been training with pros his whole life. His brother uh, is in the new national predators organization. So, you know, there's a, a lot to like there. I think uh, Ryan Leonard's going to be a really good prospect. If he ends up going to Montreal, it could be Dalibor Dvorsky. It could be a lot of things, you know, I've heard some people think Dvorsky should go top five. I still don't agree. And a lot of scouts I talked to disagree heavily there. But I think, you know, there's a, a lot of talent you can go there. Uh, while there is a drop off, I don't know if it's a huge drop off from like four to like nine, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, for the Canadians, though, they just need to keep adding assets. You know, I think this year, while they they added some nice young defensemen, I think that's a good sign. Uh, it's now like, what can you do forward and what can you do in net? And I think for uh, forwards, you want to get some guys that can help help out a guy like Slavkovsky, give him something more quality to play with. It was nice seeing him playing with some veterans this year. But, you know, I think the kind of the fun thing with Cole Caulfield was he got to play from an early age with, Suzuki and they got to really just kind of bolt to to meld together and I don't think Slavkovsky got that he was playing with guys like do you know if those players will be in the lineup next week mm -hmm. or next season type thing so it would be someone it'd be kind of cool to get a guy that could be there a bit more long term with him and give him some opportunities but I think with the Canadians it's kind of like a you're still trying to shape what this roster is going to look like you've got a lot of good prospects coming up um, I think other teams in the top five this one might be the 
with San Jose might be one of the harder ones to kind of say where this is going to go. Um, but I do like what Montreal is going to be building towards. It helps that they have like 300 draft picks over a couple years span. Um, but uh, right now I'm looking at, you know, you want to get help for a guy like Slavkowski. Yeah, I agree that they're a tough team to figure out. I even was wondering, you know, would they ever spring for a Zach Benson? And I know they already have a lot of small forwards. And obviously now that they traded for Kirby Duck, they're sort of too strong up the middle with with Nick Suzuki and Kirby Duck. But if we're just looking for ceiling for upside, I still think the Habs could use a little bit more. Because uh, even your Slavkovsky, he's a very physical player. But I, don't, I don't think he necessarily has absolute superstar upside. Um, whereas I think Benson, with the offensive game he has, it'd be interesting. Then again, I don't know. Maybe they're just, it would mean too many small guys in the system. You factor in Caulfield and, of course, Lane Hudson as well. So the Habs, to me, uh, out of the top five, are the team that I have the hardest time projecting uh, what, what they're going to do. So it'll be interesting to see. And uh, that's just the top five, but I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about Bedard and the fantasy fallout, especially as Chicago starts adding pieces as we get to free agency. It's going to be very interesting next season, and we'll see how high Bedard gets picked. It's going to depend on what his supporting cast is, I'm sure.